Section 15 of The Watergate Report, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 2. Campaign Financing Recommendations. Introduction. In making its legislative recommendations, the Select Committee has made a number of proposals that it believes will reduce the likelihood of future abuses. In so doing, it wishes to emphasize two points. First, full disclosure of contributions and expenditures, as well as of governmental action affecting contributors, is the critical minimum of campaign financing reform. But for even this minimum to be an effective tool, the data must be accessible and reviewed by those with an interest in the government process, including candidates and the press. Second, the temptation to over-regulate must be viewed in terms that such action would have on the willingness of citizens to participate voluntarily in the electoral process. For example, the committee considered a proposal to require the registration of campaign fund solicitors, since, arguably, it made little sense to identify the passive treasurer of a political committee, but not the active fundraiser. It was felt, however, that whatever benefits would flow from requiring fundraisers, such as Herbert W. Kalmbach, to register under some penalty for failure to comply, would be offset by the chilling effect such a requirement might have on speakers at local political meetings or on door-to-door -door canvassers. Since many fundraisers do not actually handle the contribution they may have solicited, it was concluded that it was not feasible to use a cut-off amount below which registration would not be required. This is not to say, however, that the idea has no merit. Footnote. The Independent Federal Elections Commission recommended this report could, of course, investigate particular alleged abuses. End footnote. A further word should be said about the timing of the enactment of the effective date of any corrective legislation. One of the most bizarre aspects of the 1972 presidential campaign was, at the time, frantic effort on the part of the Finance Committee to re-elect the President to obtain large contributions prior to April 7, 1972, so that they would not have to be reported under the then prevalent interpretation of the Corrupt Practices Act. In the weeks prior to the April 7 deadline, according to Kalmbach and others, FCRP solicitors were seeking large contributions from individuals with the inducement that the contributions would remain confidential, while later contributions would have to be publicly revealed. Sloan testified that the committee collected an avalanche of contributions during the last five days before April 7, and that he handled $6 million in contributions in the two days before April 7. In addition, in an effort to reduce the reported cash on hand as of April 7, 1972, as required by the Federal Elections Campaign Act of 1971, the FCRP prepaid for services that would not be provided until after April 7. According to Paul Barrick, Sloan's successor as treasurer of FCRP, the total of $3,787,480 was prepaid in this fashion. A similar influx of pre-April 7 contributions was found in certain Democratic campaigns. With the arrival of April 7, there was a substantial reorganization of FCRP, including the setting up of new committees and adapting the structures to the new law. It appears, however, that in a number of cases there was a spillover to post-April 7. Any significant change in the law with respect to campaign financing late in the campaign creates the potential for abuses 
such as occurred in the 1972 presidential election. Thus, it is important that any relevant changes in the law with respect to contributions or expenditures which are enacted should be done so early in the campaign and made effective upon the signing of the bill into law by the president in order to avoid a last-minute rush for contributions. 1. The committee recommends that the Congress enact legislation to establish an independent, nonpartisan Federal Elections Commission, which would replace the present tripartite administration of the Clerk of the House, Secretary of the Senate, and GAO Office of Federal Elections, and would have certain enforcement powers. Probably the most significant reform that could emerge from the Watergate scandal is the creation of an independent nonpartisan agency to supervise the enforcement of the laws relating to the conduct of elections. Such a body, given substantial investigatory and enforcement powers, could not only help ensure that misconduct would be prevented in the future, but that investigations of alleged wrongdoing would be vigorous and conducted with the confidence of the public. The present system of administration of the federal election and disclosure laws consists of a tripartite system of administration by the Clerk of the House, the Secretary of the Senate, and the GAO Office of Federal Elections. These three bodies are responsible for receiving and monitoring the reports filed by candidates for federal office and their political committees. Criminal violations discovered by these three bodies must be reported to the Justice Department for prosecution. Because the three administrative bodies are not vested with subpoena or investigative powers, the difficulty of discovering and investigating apparent violations is magnified under the present system. In addition, there is no central repository of information relating to all federal candidates. Footnote. An important function of the Commission could be to act as a repository for information and documents that would have historical interest. Further, candidates could agree to utilize this aspect of the Commission, which might be called the Library of Political Comment, to file copies of their itineraries and campaign literature so as to reduce the temptation to employ spies to learn of the activities of opposition candidates. End footnote. Each of the three bodies has developed its own rules as to monitoring the reports and making them available to the public. Separate administration makes equal treatment difficult to achieve. In addition to the administrative problems of the present system, the independence of the administrators can be questioned. As noted in a recent speech by the head of GAO, Comptroller General Elmer Statz, confidence in impartiality is weakened in a situation where the administrator comes up for appointment every two years by the employers he is required to police. With the exceptions noted below, the committee adopts sections 308 and 309 of Senate 3044, which would create a Federal Elections Commission and vest in it certain enumerated powers. Under the Senate bill, the Commission would be composed of seven members appointed by the President, with the advice and consent of the Senate, who would serve seven-year terms. Not more than four of the Commissioners would be members of the same political party. Of the seven, two members would be appointed by the President, from among individuals recommended by the President pro tempore of the Senate, upon recommendations of the Majority Leader of the Senate and the Minority Leader of the Senate, and two members would be appointed by the President from among individuals recommended by the Speaker of the House of Representatives upon the recommendations of the Majority Leader of the House and the Minority Leader of the House. With respect to the first members chosen to serve on the Commission, the committee recommends that terms be staggered in the manner provided for in Section 308A.3 of Senate 3044. 
the commission would elect a chairman and vice-chairman from among its members for a two-year term the select committee considered and rejected the proposal contained in h r seven six one two that the president appoint the chairman and vice-chairman of the commission the chairman and the vice-chairman would not be members of the same political party the select committee's recommendations as to the appointment of the commission members are designed to promote and ensure the independence and nonpartisan character of the commission the provisions of section seven three two four of title five united states code hatch act would apply to members of the commission at the end of each fiscal year the commission would report to the congress and the president concerning the action it had taken the names salaries and duties of its employees and the money it had dispersed in addition the commission would make such recommendations for legislation as it deemed necessary the commission would appoint an executive director and a general counsel to serve at the pleasure of the commission the select committee recommends that the executive director be responsible for the administrative operations of the commission and that he perform such duties as may be delegated to him by regulations or other orders of the commission because the committee believes that the commission should not be permitted to delegate to the executive director or the general counsel the power or responsibility of making any of the commission's regulations it does not adopt the wording of section three o nine h of h r seven six one two and section three o eight f of senate three zero four four which provide that the commission shall not delegate to the executive director the making of regulations regarding elections presumably this section permits the commission to delegate to the executive director the responsibility for making some regulations although it is unclear what responsibilities the executive director would have under this section the committee suggests that the nature of the commission's responsibilities would not best be served by granting to one person the ultimate power to regulate either the procedure or the administration of federal elections to ensure that the commission is responsive to the congress as well as to the president the committee supports certain other provisions of senate three zero four four thus whenever the commission submits any budget estimate or request to the president or the office of management and budget it should be required concurrently to transmit a copy of that estimate or request to the congress the committee recommends enactment of section three o eight k one of senate three zero four four which proposes that whenever the commission submits any legislative recommendations or testimony or comments on legislation requested by the congress or by any member of congress to the president or to o m b that it shall concurrently transmit a copy thereof to the congress or to the member requesting the information the committee also supports that part of section three o eight k one which proposes that no officer or agency of the united states shall have any authority to require the commission to submit its legislative recommendations or testimony or comments on legislation to any officer or agency of the united states for approval comments or review prior to the submission of such recommendations testimony or comments to the congress in addition the committee recommends that no officer or agency of the united states have authority to require the commission to submit its regulations to any officer or agency of the united states before such regulations are adopted by the commission the committee recommends that the commission be vested with all the powers included in section three o nine of senate three zero four four specifically the commission would have the power to require any person to submit written reports and answers to questions as the commission may prescribe the commission would have the power to administer oaths and to require by subpoena the attendance and testimony of witnesses and the production of all documentary and other evidence relating to the execution of its duties in addition the commission would have the power to order testimony to be taken by deposition 
and to initiate prosecute defend and appeal through its general counsel any civil action in the name of the commission in order to give the commission primary jurisdiction over enforcement of statutes regulating federal elections and campaigns the committee supports section three o nine d of senate three zero four four this section provides that notwithstanding any other provision of law the commission would be the primary civil enforcement agency for violations of the provisions of senate three zero four four and sections six o two 608 and 610 to 617 of title 18 united states code while senate 3044 provides that any violation of such provision shall be prosecuted by the attorney general or department of justice personnel after consultation with and obtaining the consent of the commission the select committee recommends in accordance with its other recommendations that the commission refer apparent criminal violations to the permanent office of public attorney when appropriate the present statutory framework is deficient in failing to provide a civil penalty there are numerous provisions of present and proposed law which if violated would best be handled on a civil rather than a criminal basis for example the late filing of required campaign financing reports traditionally have gone unpunished because the violation of law did not appear to merit the imposition of a criminal penalty imposing a civil fine would be an appropriate means of enforcing this statute in non-flagrant cases consequently the committee recommends adoption of section three o nine e one of senate three zero four four providing for a civil penalty of up to ten thousand dollars for each violation of the provisions of senate three zero four four and of sections six o two six o eight and six ten through six seventeen of title eighteen united states code civil penalties would be assessed by the commission only after the person charged with a violation had been given an opportunity for a hearing the committee also supports section three o nine f of senate three zero four four which provides a mechanism by which the commission may provide advisory opinions the commission would issue such opinions within a reasonable time as to whether any specific transaction or activity inquired of constitutes a violation of senate three zero four four or of any provision of title eighteen united states code over the commission has primary jurisdiction footnote another function of the commission could be to publicize the relevant laws and the importance of citizen participation in politics whether by expending time and effort in a contest or making a small contribution for example importance of this activity in generating small contributions is demonstrated by the quadrupling of the use of the income tax checkoff following its being moved to page one of irs form ten forty and the simultaneous publicity given to it End footnote. two the committee recommends enactment of a statute prohibiting cash contributions and expenditures in excess of one hundred dollars in connection with any campaign for nomination or election for federal office although the reporting and disclosure requirements of the federal election campaign act minimize the availability of unaccounted for campaign funds there is presently no federal statute regulating the use of cash during political campaigns the difficulties of tracing the use of cash contributions and expenditures during a campaign are apparent the committee's investigations showed the abuses of cash funding during the nineteen seventy two campaign cash contributions from corporations as well as individuals and cash expenditures by political committees were commonplace corporate funds were illegally laundered through foreign banks and subsidiaries and then contributed in cash form to political committees which reported neither the source nor the ultimate use of the money 
the exact amount of cash collected during the campaign cannot accurately be determined however in testimony before the select committee hugh sloan testified that of the twenty million dollars collected by the campaign prior to april seventh nineteen seventy two one point seven or one point eight million dollars was in cash and cash contributions to democratic candidates totaled hundreds of thousands of dollars a prohibition on cash contributions in excess of one hundred dollars coupled with the disclosure requirements of the nineteen seventy one act would be a deterrent against unreported cash contributions from individuals and corporations in this regard the committee supports section 616 of senate 3044 which prohibits political contributions in the aggregate over one hundred dollars unless the contribution is made by a written instrument such as a check identifying the person making the contribution the committee also supports section 311 b of the bill which prohibits a political committee from expending in excess of one hundred dollars in cash in connection with a single purchase or transaction in this regard there may be instances where larger amounts of cash may have to be expended for example buying meals for campaign workers and it may be desirable for the commission to have the power to make limited exceptions by regulation and require certain record-keeping or the like three the committee recommends enactment of statute requiring each candidate for the office of president or vice president to designate one political committee as his central campaign committee with one or more banks as his campaign depositories under the present system of campaign disclosures every political committee supporting a presidential candidate must file periodic reports with the office of federal elections of the general accounting office footnote section three o four a of the federal election campaign act of nineteen seventy one provides in part each treasurer of a political committee supporting a candidate or candidates for election to federal office and each candidate for election to such office shall file with the appropriate supervisory officer reports of receipts and expenditures on forms to be prescribed or approved by him such reports shall be filed on the tenth day of march june and september in each year and on the fifteenth and fifth days next preceding the date on which an election is held and also by the thirty-first day of january End footnote. there is no present requirement however that a presidential candidate consolidate the records of contributions and expenditures of political committees made for his benefit or on his behalf thereby partially undermining the law's disclosure requirements during the nineteen seventy two campaign contributions and expenditures for particular candidates were made into and out of hundreds of committees in the interest of establishing more uniform accounting and reporting procedure the select committee recommends the adoption of sections three ten and three eleven of senate three zero four four footnote these provisions are virtually identical to sections three ten and three eleven of senate three seven two which passed the senate on july thirty nineteen seventy three end footnote section three ten requires each candidate to designate one political committee as a central campaign committee and permits each candidate for the office of president to designate one political committee in each state as his state campaign committee for that state footnote section three o one of the federal election campaign act of nineteen seventy one defines the term candidate as follows an individual who seeks nomination for election or election to federal office whether or not such individual is elected and for purposes of this paragraph an individual shall be deemed to seek nomination for election or election if he has one taken the action necessary under the law of a state to qualify himself for nomination for election or election to federal office or 
two received contributions or made expenditures or has given his consent for any other person to receive contributions or make expenditures with a view to bringing about his nomination for election or election to such office End footnote. central campaign committees would be required to file statements and reports with the federal elections commission other political committees which are not central campaign committees of the candidate would be required to file their statements and reports with the central campaign committee instead of the commission laundering of funds is often accomplished by contributing and transferring funds from committee to committee so as to obscure the original source and make it impossible to trace the money to the intended beneficiary or use the select committee believes that the requirements of a central campaign committee and a designated depository increase the traceability of campaign funds by putting the responsibility for collecting and reporting campaign financial information in a centralized place four the committee recommends enactment of a statutory limitation on overall campaign expenditures of presidential candidates the committee proposes a limit on expenditures of 12 cents times the voting age population during a general election. Present law permits unlimited spending for presidential campaigns. As a result, the cost of presidential campaigns has been rising at an astounding rate. In 1956, President Eisenhower's campaign for re-election cost approximately $8 million. The 1972 presidential campaign cost over $100 million. If presidential candidates are permitted to raise unlimited amounts of money, campaign spending will continue to soar, leading to uneven access to the electorate and surpluses in the hands of certain candidates. The Select Committee believes that a limit on contributions by source must be accompanied by an overall limit on expenditures. Since a $3,000 limitation on campaign contributions recommended below is an advantage to incumbent candidates who are able to obtain moderate-sized contributions from a large number of individuals, an overall limit on campaign expenditures is needed to minimize the disparity in campaign spending between incumbents and challengers. Footnote there may be a constitutional argument against limiting campaign expenditures that the government cannot deprive a candidate of the right to address voters or the right of voters to be exposed to the issues in a campaign see election reform basic references of course there are considerations that support reasonable limitations and it is believed that a limitation such as appears in senate three zero four four would be acceptable to the courts End footnote. the committee recommends the adoption of the limitation provided for in section six fourteen of senate three zero four four as passed by the senate as reported by the senate committee on rules and administration the bill called for an overall limitation of fifteen cents times the voting age population of the united states footnote the term voting age population is defined in section 504 g of senate three zero four four as resident population eighteen years of age or older End footnote. the full senate however adopted an amendment introduced by senator james allen democrat alabama to reduce to twelve cents the multiplier applied to the voting age population to obtain the overall limitation the bill also provides that expenditures made by or on behalf of a vice presidential candidate are for purposes of the expenditure limitation considered to be made by the presidential candidates with whom he is running the select committee further recommends a limitation on expenditures of presidential candidates in primary elections in this regard the committee recommends adoption of the limitation provided for in section 504a 2a of senate 3044 this section provides for an expenditure limit of quote, two times the amount 
which a candidate for nomination for election to the office of senator from that state may expend in that state in connection with his primary election campaign end quote. while the imposition of a realistic ceiling is an important and necessary reform caution should be exercised lest a ceiling be placed so low as virtually to ensure the renomination and re-election of incumbents since an incumbent is generally better known and begins with a substantial built-in advantage to limit challengers unduly would prevent their getting known and instituting a serious challenge furthermore it should be recognized that it costs a considerable amount of money to raise small and medium-sized contributions it costs very little to solicit more than ten million dollars in contributions in one hundred thousand dollar increments on the other hand many direct mail campaigns designed to raise large numbers of small contributions actually lose money footnote according to a study prepared for the committee by g a o a large portion of the contributions to the presidential campaigns would have been lost if there was a limit of three thousand dollars g a o estimates that the candidates would have lost the following proportion of their total receipts nixon fifty two per cent mcgovern twenty seven per cent humphrey sixty nine per cent muskie thirty three per cent and footnote inflationary factors should be taken into account in any ceiling to permit an upward adjustment the committee recommends that any overall limit on campaign expenditures be evaluated following the first election in which it applies to make certain that it is neither too low nor too high end of section fifteen recording by linda johnson Section 16 of the Watergate Report, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 2, Section 16. Chapter 4. Campaign Financing, Part 16. 5. The committee recommends enactment of a statutory limitation of three thousand dollars on political contributions by any individuals to the campaign of each presidential candidate during the pre-nomination period and a separate three thousand dollar limitation during the post-nomination period a contribution to a vice presidential candidate of a party would be considered for the purposes of the limitation a contribution to that party's presidential candidate the basic purpose of a limit on contributions from any one source is to minimize the potential influence or appearance of impropriety which might result from large contributions an additional objective of the limit is to broaden the base of candidates financial support by appealing to larger numbers of voters however the limit must not be set so low as to make private financing of elections impractical in addition the limitation must meet the apparent first amendment requirement that restrictions on political contributions be limited to the minimum regulation necessary to serve a compelling need although present law does not limit the amount of contributions to presidential candidates eighteen u s c six o eight the federal corrupt practices act which was repealed by the federal election campaign act of nineteen seventy one did prohibit contributions in excess of five thousand dollars fraught with ambiguity and loopholes this limitation proved to be totally ineffective in part because there was no recommendation of single committee responsibility any statutory prohibition should be drafted so as to avoid the problems of the earlier statute the committee believes that a separate three thousand dollar contribution limitation is reasonable as applied to presidential campaigns thus an individual could contribute three thousand dollars to candidate a and a separate three thousand dollars to candidate b during the pre-nomination period if candidate a becomes the nominee of his party this individual would be allowed to give an additional three thousand dollars to candidate a's campaign during the general election while any limitation is somewhat arbitrary the committee considers president nixon's proposal of a fifteen thousand dollar limitation for each campaign primary runoff and general election to be too high 
under s thirty forty four as passed by the senate the three thousand dollar limitation does not apply separately to the primary and the general election period a necessary corollary to a limit on contributions to presidential candidates is a limitation on independent expenditures on behalf of a candidate without his authorization such expenditures if unrestricted could be used to avoid and thereby undermine any limitation on contributions for example a person might purchase a series of full-page newspaper advertisements on behalf of a candidate on the other hand there are serious constitutional arguments against an outright prohibition on independent campaign expenditures in view of the right of expression guaranteed by the first amendment a reasonable solution seems to be the adoption of a rule to the effect that if an individual acted on his own and not at the suggestion or request of the candidate he could expend a separate one thousand dollars on behalf of one or more candidates during the pre-nomination and general election periods and would have the responsibility for reporting expenditures aggregating over one hundred dollars on behalf of any candidate such independent expenditures on behalf of a candidate would not count towards the overall expenditure limit of the candidate the committee believes that this limitation is a constitutional balance between the competing interests of free speech and the governmental interest in campaign regulation six the committee recommends that the internal revenue code be amended to provide a credit in a substantial amount on individual and joint federal income tax returns for any contribution made in a calendar year to a political party or any candidate seeking election to any public office federal state or local in light of the fact that strict limitations on the form and amount of contributions are likely to create a shortage in the availability of campaign funds the committee recommends the adoption of an effective new incentive to encourage an adequate number of small contributions the incentive which the committee suggests is a one hundred per cent tax credit for contributions up to a certain level for example twenty five dollars for an individual return and fifty dollars for a joint return the present law provides that a taxpayer may claim a fifty per cent tax credit for a contribution up to twelve dollars and fifty cents or a tax deduction up to fifty dollars the amount is doubled in the case of a joint return the basic argument in favor of a one hundred per cent tax credit is that it provides a substantial amount of encouragement to the individual particularly when combined with an educational campaign to exercise his option to contribute to the candidate of his choice without the government becoming involved directly in using tax funds for partisan campaign purposes certain other points may be made about the one hundred per cent credit first it draws on previous experience with a fifty per cent tax credit and does not involve a wholesale reorganization of the present system with the risk that new problems will unexpectedly emerge second it is essentially a self-generating system which does not require a substantial machinery to administer and third it involves a uniform approach to primaries and elections and deals with the difficult problems of defining the desired level of support if any when there is a large number of fringe candidates old parties that seem to have lost their followings and new ones that appeal to a large number of voters it should be noted that the proposal basically ties government support to the support that the candidate has among the electorate and not to the support he may have among contributors this is the case because aside from the few months delay before a citizen can offset his tax credit against his taxes a contribution below the credit ceiling costs a taxpaying contributor nothing seven the committee recommends against the adoption of any form of public financing in which tax monies are collected and allocated to political candidates by the federal government the select committee opposes the various proposals which have been offered in the congress to provide mandatory public financing of campaigns for federal office while recognizing the basis of support for the concept of public financing and the potential difficulty in adequately funding campaigns in the midst of strict limitations on the form and amount of contributions the committee takes issue with the contention that public financing affords either an effective or appropriate solution thomas jefferson believed to compel a man to furnish contributions of money for the propagation of opinions which he disbelieves and abhors is sinful and tyrannical the committee's opposition is based like jefferson's 
upon the fundamental need to protect the voluntary right of individual citizens to express themselves politically as guaranteed by the first amendment furthermore we find inherent dangers in authorizing the federal bureaucracy to fund and excessively regulate political campaigns the abuses experienced during the nineteen seventy two campaign and unearthed by the select committee were perpetrated in the absence of any effective regulation of the source form or amount of campaign contributions in fact despite the progress made by the federal elections campaign act of nineteen seventy one in requiring full public disclosure of contributions the nineteen seventy two campaign still was funded through a system of essentially unrestricted private financing what now seems appropriate is not the abandonment of private financing but rather the reform of that system in an effort to vastly expand the voluntary participation of individual citizens while avoiding the abuses of earlier campaigns eight the committee recommends enactment of a statute prohibiting the solicitation or receipt of campaign contributions from foreign nationals under present law eighteen u s c six thirteen it is a felony to solicit accept or receive a political contribution from a foreign principal or an agent of a foreign principal section six thirteen also prohibits an agent of a foreign principal from making a political contribution on behalf of his principal or in his capacity as agent of the principal the legality of political contributions by foreign nationals then hinges on the definition of the term foreign principal the department of justice has expressed the opinion that the term foreign principal as used in the section six thirteen does not have the same meaning as foreign national since the term principal connotes the existence of an agency relationship it is the department's view that a foreign national is a foreign principal within the meaning of section six thirteen only if the principal has an agent within the united states therefore in the opinion of the department it is not a violation of the statute to accept a direct political contribution from a foreign national who does not have an agent within the united states as used in the prohibiting statute the term foreign principal includes governments of foreign countries foreign political parties persons outside the united states who are not u s citizens and partnerships associations corporations organizations or other combinations of persons organized under the laws of or having its principal place of business in a foreign country the legislative history of eighteen u s c six thirteen explains why the statute sanctions direct contributions by foreign nationals while prohibiting contributions by their agents the statute was enacted into law as part of the foreign agents registration act amendments of nineteen sixty six the thrust of the nineteen sixty six amendments was to require disclosure of the political activity of foreign agents within the united states the committee report of the senate foreign relations committee states the act is intended to protect the interests of the united states by requiring complete public disclosure by persons acting for or in the interests of foreign principles where their activities are political in nature or border on the political such public disclosures as required by the act will permit the government and the people of the united states to be informed as to the identities and activities of such persons and so be better able to appraise them and the purposes for which they act the congress did not consider the issue of direct political contributions by foreign nationals when it enacted the foreign agents registration act or its nineteen sixty six amendments furthermore none of the other major acts of congress dealing with political campaigns and elections the corrupt practices act the hatch act and the federal election campaign act of nineteen seventy one has amended federal law to prohibit direct contributions by foreign nationals thus the present statute permits political contributions from individuals who neither reside in the united states nor have the right to vote in elections within the united states investigations by the select committee have revealed that a number of political contributions including loans to u s citizens were in fact made by foreign nationals who were associated with or employed by firms doing business in the united states presumably these contributors were motivated by a desire to support candidates whom they expected to create or maintain a favorable atmosphere for the business community or their specific economic interest 
other foreign nationals indicated to the committee that their contributions were motivated by a general interest in american presidential politics and world leadership in addition to direct contributions by foreign nationals during 1972, hundreds of thousands of dollars, including illegal contributions from corporate funds, were laundered through foreign banks and foreign companies. These abuses illustrate that the present statute, which sanctions direct contributions by foreign nationals, undercuts other election laws, such as the disclosure requirements and the prohibition on corporate contributions. Furthermore, since foreign banks generally are not subject to U.S. law and enforcement process, laundered funds are difficult to trace. The proposed statute would prohibit political contributions by foreign nationals whether or not they have agents within the United States. An exception to the general prohibition should be made to permit contributions by resident immigrants who intend to reside in the United States on a permanent basis who have a legitimate interest in presidential elections. In addition, because of the limited interest on the part of foreign nationals who reside in the United States during a substantial part of the year, even though they lack permanent residence status in the affairs of this country, some attention should be given to permit some political contribution activity on the part of these persons, such as by authorizing contributions in reduced amounts. The proposed prohibition on contributions by foreign nationals is based on the belief that those who cannot vote in American elections should not be permitted to influence elections in this country by making contributions to political campaigns. The argument is bolstered by the notion that foreign nationals do not have a stake in our electoral process. Their loyalties are to their own countries and their own governments. The prohibition, then, helps protect the integrity of our campaign financing system without depriving any citizen or permanent resident of the right to contribute to campaigns. The recommended prohibition should be implemented by placing responsibility on the candidates or the candidates' political committees to refuse donations proffered by foreign nationals. Present disclosure and reporting laws require the name of the donor, his mailing address, occupation, and principal place of business on all contributions over $10. Therefore, the responsibility to refuse prohibited foreign contributions would not impose an undue burden on candidates or their committees. 9. The committee recommends that no government official whose appointment required confirmation by the Senate or who was on the payroll of the Executive Office of the President be permitted to participate in the solicitation or receipt of campaign contributions during his or her period of service and for a period of one year thereafter. During the 1972 campaign, there was a widespread transfer of key administration officials from the White House and from departments and agencies to high positions in the campaign effort. In certain cases, these officials or their assistants went to the very persons over whom they previously wielded regulatory or other power to solicit campaign contributions particularly in view of the likelihood that many of these officials would return to the government, solicitation by them may well have had undesirable coercive aspects. While the entire practice of carving the campaign force out of the administration on a temporary basis seems highly questionable, the committee recommends as a minimum step that high administration officials who leave to enter the campaign be barred from engaging in fundraising activities for a period of one year. 10. The committee recommends that stringent limitations be imposed on the right of organizations to contribute to presidential campaigns. One of the major abuses investigated by the Select Committee was the apparent attempt on the part of several large dairy cooperatives to utilize their contribution potential of millions of dollars to influence administration decisions. The ability of associations and organizations whether they be composed of individuals, corporations, or unions, to band together and pool their contributions has given rise to enormous contributions. At the present time, a number of organizations have hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars ready to be mobilized for a particular candidate or cause. In a proposed system, which limits the size of individual contributions and campaign expenditures, it would be intolerable if organizations could continue to offer and contribute huge amounts of money. Whether it is desirable or, in view of the First Amendment right to free speech and assembly, constitutional 
to ban outright the ability of individuals or entities to pool their resources is open to question in any case a limit must be placed on the right of organizations to make contributions in the context of a presidential race it appears that a limit of six thousand dollars the figure contained in s thirty forty four would tend to avoid the problem of undue influence by organizations while providing them an opportunity to participate in the political process in the event that organizations are permitted to make contributions to presidential campaigns certain procedural reforms should be enacted for union or corporate committees covered by sections six ten and six eleven of title eighteen first that individual members of any organization which solicits contributions be permitted to designate the ultimate recipient of the contribution second that organization officials who are given the power to allocate funds not designated by the members be democratically elected third that the organization make periodic audited financial reports to the persons participating fourth that members of organizations be given the option to contribute directly to the candidate of their choice without the knowledge of their superiors eleven the committee recommends that violations of the major provisions of the campaign financing law such as participating in a corporate or union contribution or a contribution in excess of the statutory limit and making a foreign contribution shall constitute a felony at the present time violation of the law prohibiting contributions by corporations or labor unions is punishable by up to one year in prison or two years if the violation was willful section 610 of title 18 on the other hand contributions by a foreign national in violation of section 613 of title 18 or by a government contractor in violation of section 611 of title 18 are punishable up to five years imprisonment and there is no provision for a non-wilful misdemeanor charge the committee believes that in view of the seriousness that attaches to any contribution from sources prohibited by law violation of all of the above provisions relating to corporate or union contribution should be treated the same as sections 611 and 612 it further believes that the provision which creates a non-wilful violation of section 610 should be removed and that conduct that might be covered by such a provision for example the negligent participation in a corporate contribution by the comptroller of a company should be treated as a civil violation in the past year the availability of the misdemeanor provision in section 610 has permitted the special prosecutor to encourage the voluntary disclosure of illegal corporate contributions public testimony from and private interviews of corporate executives reflected both an ignorance of the provisions of section 610 and the belief that violation of this provision was merely a technical violation of law in view of recent events including the committee's public hearings it appears proper to consider the giving of an illegal corporate contribution for what it is namely the illegal diversion of money held in trust and to treat it with the seriousness it deserves as a felony end of section sixteen section seventeen of the watergate report volume two this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 2, Section 17. Chapter 5. Milk Fund. Introduction. National attention was first focused on the nation's leading dairy cooperatives in 1971, when it was discovered that the administration's decision to raise the level of federal milk price support subsidies for dairy farmers was followed almost immediately by some contributions which within six months amounted to more than three hundred thousand dollars to republican committees including about a quarter of a million dollars to president nixon's re-election committees established especially for the milk money when the select committee undertook its investigation of the alleged quid pro quo it soon found that price supports were just one item on the dairyman agenda in fact the milk producers representing one of the wealthiest political funds in america and one of the largest groups of contributors to the nineteen seventy two campaign 
had actively sought favorable action from the nixon administration throughout its first term on a number of matters of great financial importance to dairy farmers at the same time that they were pledging hundreds of thousands and even millions of dollars to president nixon's re-election campaign with the knowledge of the president himself and with the encouragement of top presidential aides and fundraisers the milk price support increase in 1971, granted by the president, was worth at least tens of millions of dollars to the milk producers, and they spared no effort in seeking that favorable action. In 1970, the co-op leaders had pledged $2 million or more to the president's campaign, and when called upon to reaffirm that pledge before the president's favorable decision was announced the following March, the dairymen readily obliged those involved in the march 1971 price support matter the president his key aides including haldeman ehrlichman and colson and dairy representatives each deny that there was a quid pro quo of dairy contributions in exchange for the presidential increase the president has asserted that instead his action was influenced primarily by democratic congressional pressure generated by the dairymen for an increase coupled with the president's fear of losing dairyman support in his 1972 re-election bid if he opposed them. Much of what the president says is supported by the surrounding events. The dairy lobby had successfully gathered the support of about a quarter of each house in support of bills to raise the support level. But the president's position does not take into account other key facts uncovered by the select committee in the course of its investigation, which shed light on the type of potential support the dairymen represented. To be sure, there were economic arguments advanced to support an increase. However, all of the president's agricultural economic experts opposed an increase on the merits. The crux of the committee's investigation was, thus, not whether it was the correct decision, but whether the president made that decision for the wrong reason. The president was well aware that at the time he considered the price support matter, the milk producers had pledged $2 million to his campaign, but had not delivered one penny toward that pledge. In March 1971, at least some dairy leaders had considered boycotting further Republican fundraising efforts because of the administration's position on price supports. At the same time, the president's re-election campaign had just been organized and was seeking early money toward a campaign goal of $40 million. What's more, meeting that goal was considered very important because the president faced a tough, even uphill fight for re-election. In one leading presidential poll at the time, the president trailed the Democratic frontrunner, Senator Muskie, by a full five percentage points. With that as the setting, the president, on March 23, 1971, met first with dairy leaders in the cabinet room, and then later that day with his top aides in the Oval Office, where he announced his decision which reversed the decision of the administration announced 11 days earlier. At the conclusion of the second meeting, a presidential aide was instructed to alert the dairymen of the decision before its public announcement. The message to the dairymen carried an additional twist. The committee has uncovered evidence to show that on the 23rd, the co-op leaders were informed that an increase was a good possibility but not certain. The second dimension to the message concerned dairy contributions. A key dairy leader, Harold Nelson, was expected to reaffirm the $2 million pledge at a late-night meeting, arranged by Ehrlichman, prior to the public announcement with dairy lawyer and Nixon associate Murray Schotner and Herbert Kalmbach, the president's personal attorney and chief fundraiser. During the 24 hours prior to the meeting, Nelson engaged in last-minute efforts to seek substantial commitments from his fellow dairy leaders and at the prearranged meeting kalmbach was informed of the reaffirmation in view of the price support increase which had been set for the next day the increase was announced as scheduled and in the weeks and months that followed the milk money flowed to the president's campaign other matters of importance to the milk producers included dairy import quotas government cheese purchase and school milk programs and the approach taken by the antitrust division of the justice department toward certain practices of the dairy co-ops 
at least some of these matters were discussed time and again by dairy leaders and presidential aides at the very time that large presidential contributions were also mentioned the tone of milk producer nixon administration contacts is exemplified by other events in the president's first term in mid-1969, the milk producers gave $100,000 cash to Kalmbach, later paid from corporate funds, and promised $150,000 more that year directly in exchange for the opportunity to meet with White House aides to press their case for higher price supports and meetings with the president himself. In 1970, in the course of their subsequent dealings with Colson on dairy problems, the milk producers stepped up their commitments to at least $2 million, and Colson is reported to have replied, this is a $2 million package. Colson subsequently informed the president of the pledge. Several months later, a dairy lawyer and friend of the president, in a letter to the president, referred to arrangements underway with Kalmbach for the $2 million contribution, and then went on to ask the president for favorable action on a pending dairy import quota matter. In 1972, in the course of efforts by Kalmbach to raise another $750,000 from the milk producers, a top dairy leader is alleged to have overtly offered the money in exchange for White House help in terminating an antitrust suit that had been filed by the Justice Department against his co-op. But the offer was rejected and the lawsuit has proceeded. In all, the milk producers provided a total of some $632,500 to the president's re-election effort, including $245,000 furnished to the campaign just prior to the election. Whatever the legal significance of the circumstances of the 1971 price support increase, and these and other matters, the milk producers perceived some Nixon officials as having a dual role of both policymaker and fundraiser. Whether or not these two roles were directly tied, they appeared to the dairymen to be linked, and this had a significant impact on the approach taken by them. Nelson said they gave the first $100,000 in 1969 because it appeared we were not going to get any place if we did not. And when called upon in March 1971 to reaffirm the $2 million pledge, Nelson explained that he felt he had no choice. We knew, and Kalmbach knew, that we were interested in matters other than just the price support decision. We weren't in any position to say, if you don't do this, we're not going to make the contribution. I think they would have been fully justified in saying, we don't want any more conversations with you about anything. These matters are elaborated on in detail in the Milk Fund report that follows. At the end of the report, a list of key persons and organizations, a chronology of the events detailed in the report, and selected documents are presented as Appendices A, B, and C, respectively. The report represents the culmination of a nine-month investigation begun in September 1973 and conducted jointly by the committee majority and minority staff and involved interviews with over a 100 persons who were present or former officials of the White House and the Executive Office of the President, the Department of Agriculture, the Justice Department, the Treasury Department, the Internal Revenue Service, and the leading milk producer cooperatives. Executive session testimony, totaling several thousand pages, was taken from over 30 witnesses, most of which is printed together with accompanying exhibits, affidavits, and additional documents in volumes 14 through 17 of the committee's hearings. One key element, White House materials, has been consistently denied by the President to the committee, thereby limiting the completeness of the committee's investigation. The committee made repeated requests to the White House for tapes and documents, and finally subpoenaed the President for them. Even though the President did not assert executive privilege as to some of these materials, which, in fact, had been handed over to private litigants in a lawsuit, the White House withheld everything from the committee. What's more, although the White House published its own account of the meeting with the President in which he raised price supports, the President asserted executive privilege preventing several of his aides present at that meeting, including the Secretary of Agriculture, from testifying about the discussions with the President. Some, but by no means all, of these materials, sought by the committee months ago, was recently provided to the Judiciary Committee of the House of Representatives considering impeachment of the President. 
although these materials were unavailable to the select committee at the time this report was prepared they have been publicly released by the house committee and the principal additional materials are included in appendix d to this report the committee's milk fund investigation was conducted in such a way so as to respect the rights of potential defendants in fact the committee postponed its hearings on the milk fund at the request of the u s attorney for the southern district of new york because of the pendency of the vesco trial moreover at the direct request of the special prosecutor the committee withdrew its application granted by the court for immunity for a key witness jake jacobson involved in aspects of the milk fund in addition charles colson was not available to the committee sufficiently in advance of the preparation of its report to permit his interrogation by the committee none the less the committee believes the milk fund report is a comprehensive presentation of the presently available evidence much of which was first uncovered by the committee concerning the relationship between the leading milk producer cooperatives and the president in his 1972 re-election campaign. 1. Background. The three leading dairy cooperatives and their political arms. Farmer cooperatives are not a new phenomenon. For many years, farmers, including dairy farmers, have been banding together in cooperatives for the purpose of marketing their products for the mutual benefit of their members. In the late 1960s, however, the growth of dairy farmer cooperatives took a dramatic turn. Under the leadership of a few individuals, numerous cooperatives were merged into three large dairy co-ops, combining over 60,000 dairy farmers and covering essentially contiguous areas in the southeast, southwest, and midwest. Together, the three co-ops account for about 25% of all milk produced in this country. One lawyer for the dairy co-ops testified before the select committee that their intention was to expand all the way up the Mississippi Valley to the Canadian border. One key dairy leader has even stated that he believed all dairy farmers in the country should belong to one cooperative. This emergence of the large multi-state dairy co-op was also marked by another event, the creation by each of the three co-ops of a political arm consisting of thousands of farmer members, each contributing up to nearly $100 annually for a total political chest of hundreds of thousands and even millions of dollars each year. These huge sums of money were placed at the disposal of one or two leaders of each co-op. One of these leaders testified that he viewed the contributions to be made by these political arms as giving the dairy co-ops political power and, at the very least, access to our governmental leaders, including the President. The formation, development, and activities of the three co-ops and their political arms were, in many instances, coordinated. Before turning to their involvement, both joint and separate, in the 1972 presidential campaign, a brief description of the three co-ops, Associated Milk Producers, Incorporated, Dairymen, Incorporated, and Mid-America Dairymen, Incorporated, their political arms and principal officers is set forth below. A. Associated Milk Producers, Incorporated. The largest and in many ways most politically active dairy co-op is Associated Milk Producers, Incorporated, known by its acronym AMPI. Its political action arm, until April 7, 1972, was Trust for Agricultural Political Education, or TAPE. TAPE was replaced by C-TAPE. 1. AMPI AMPI consists of approximately 40,000 members in the southwest and central and upper Midwestern states. It was formed in late 1969 from the merger of Milk Producers Incorporated, MPI, a co-op of farmers primarily in the southwest, and a number of other co-ops. It is headquartered in San Antonio, Texas. AMPI is governed by a board of directors consisting of approximately 50 directors who are elected from the various geographic divisions and regions of the co-op. However, full management authority is vested in the general manager, who is the chief executive officer with authority, among other matters, to hire and fire all corporate employees, attorneys, and consultants. John Butterbrot, a Wisconsin dairy farmer, has been the only president of the board. The leaders of MPI were primarily responsible for the formation of AMPI and, indeed, the other two major co-ops, and became its principal officers. 
harold s nelson a lawyer and the general manager of mpi became general manager of ampi david l parr division manager for the arkansas division of mpi remained in little rock under the new organization but became special counsel to the general manager nelson testified that parr was involved in all phases of ampi activities and that no one in the organization besides parr and him had such a broad range of responsibilities in a very practical as well as formal sense nelson and parr ran ampi nelson's principal lieutenants included bob a lilly and robert o isham lilly had been employed as a lobbyist by the texas state farm bureau in the nineteen sixties one of his principal areas of responsibility for ampi under nelson was lobbying and other political activity mostly at the state level but also on some important national matters such as federal milk price supports isham a texas cpa was the company's comptroller on january twelfth nineteen seventy two a change of management took place when the board replaced nelson with dr george l Marin, a former assistant secretary of agriculture in the johnson administration and later an ampi consultant parr and several other ampi employees left ampi shortly after the january nineteen seventy two change two tape c tape the idea of a political fund for dairy farmers was new to the co-op leadership consequently nelson turned to others for advice and guidance one lawyer nelson retained was jake jacobson who had been in the johnson white house and who has been a friend of john connolly for twenty-five years jacobson advised nelson and ampi and spoke at numerous meetings of the co-ops in nineteen sixty nine nineteen seventy and nineteen seventy one in an apparent effort to strengthen their organizations in light of his political experience it is not surprising that the milk producers through jacobson would have sought out connolly for his advice in connection with the formation of tape indeed connolly testified that jacobson and nelson had informed him shortly after his term as texas governor ended in nineteen sixty nine that they wanted to form the fund and he advised them that there appeared to be no legal impediments in february nineteen sixty nine tape was formed as a trust to collect monies from its participant donors almost entirely dairy farmer members and ampi employees and make political contributions on behalf of state and federal candidates for public office donations were made by checkoffs both from cooperative payments to its members for the co-op sale of their milk and from employee paychecks the donations were limited by tape to just under one hundred dollars per year in order to avoid the requirement to report publicly to the clerk of the house of representatives the identity of contributors of one hundred dollars or more under the then applicable corrupt practices act of nineteen twenty five the use of the technique of withholding together with the amount withheld and the large number of donors resulted in a steady flow of substantial amounts of money into the trust tape developed the potential as an ampi lawyer emphasized to republican fundraisers of one million dollars each year the trust fund has exceeded its potential in calendar year nineteen seventy two for example it spent nearly one million dollars and still had nearly nine hundred thousand dollars cash on hand at year's end isham was named the trustee of tape although the tape trust agreement vested him with sole authority to expend tape funds the enormous tape resources were at the almost complete control of one or at most two other individuals harold nelson and to a more limited extent david parr nelson stated that in practical terms he made all policy decisions for tape in nineteen seventy two with the advent of new ampi management and with the effective date of the federal election campaign act of nineteen seventy one a new entity was created to involve more persons in the decision-making processes for expending the political fund the new organization the committee for thorough agricultural political education c tape was formed in march nineteen seventy two with Marin as treasurer and lilly as secretary and by the end of that year tape had transferred to c tape substantially all its funds pursuant to authorizations solicited from tape donors from the effective date of the new law april seventh nineteen seventy two until the end of nineteen seventy two c tape was one of the wealthiest political funds of its kind in the country b 
Dairyman Incorporated. The smallest of the three co-ops, with a membership of approximately 10,000, is Dairyman Incorporated, or DI, which was formed in 1968. Its formation, and that of its political arm, Trust for Special Political Agricultural Community Education, SPACE, were essentially contemporaneous with those of AMPI and TAPE. 1. DI DI is a corporation based in Louisville, Kentucky, and its members consist of dairy farmers in the southeastern portion of the United States. Its organizational structure is not dissimilar from that of AMPI. In practice, however, control of its policies do not appear to have resided in one person to the same degree as was the case for AMPI. John Moser was elected president of the DI Board of Directors, Paul Alegia, a Louisville lawyer, served as its executive director from its beginning until March 1971, when he returned to his law practice. At that time, he was replaced by Ben F. Morgan, Jr., who currently serves in that position. One DI employee with responsibility in the area of legislation and political matters is Joseph Westwater, currently vice president for special projects. Westwater joined DI in 1969, but did not become involved in space activities until after Morgan replaced Elegia. When Parr left AMPI in February 1972, he soon found employment with another of the three co-ops, DI. Although, as is noted later in this report, Parr did attend at least one meeting thereafter in which contributions to the president's re-election campaign were discussed, he testified he has not generally been involved at DI in matters relating to political contributions. 2. SPACE SPACE was formed in March 1969 at essentially the same time as the formation of TAPE. Since Nelson consulted with the DI leadership on the formation of SPACE, not surprisingly, it was organized in virtually the same way as TAPE. The co-op's comptroller, Jim Mueller, became the sole trustee for the trust funds. Funds were generated from regular checkoffs from farmer checks, checkoffs were limited to a level just below $100, and practical control of the funds rested with the DI leadership. Although the space membership was considerably smaller than TAPE, its fund has been substantial. In 1972, for example, space receipts and expenditures each totaled nearly $300,000. C. Mid-America Dairymen Incorporated Mid-America Dairymen Incorporated, Mid-Am, is headquartered in Springfield, Missouri, covering portions of the Midwest. 1. Mid-Am Mid-Am was formed in 1968 along the same lines as DI and later AMPI. It has a membership of approximately 20,000. William Powell was elected president of the Mid-Am board. As in the case of AMPI and DI, Day-to-day -day control of the co-op rested in top management. Its principal officer appears to have been Gary E. Hanman. Hanman has been with Mid-Am since its formation and has held the position of senior vice president for the past several years. 2. Adept With advice and encouragement from AMPI and DI, Mid-Am formed its own political fund in the middle of 1970. Hanman received advice from Nelson Parr Jacobson and another AMPI attorney, W. DeVere Pearson. The result was a trust patterned along the same lines as were TAPE and SPACE, called the Agricultural and Dairy Educational Political Trust, ADEPT. In July 1970, shortly after ADEPT's inception, TAPE loaned the fund $8,500 to enable it to begin its contribution activity. William A. Delano, the Mid-Am Comptroller, was the adept trustee. However, Hanman apparently played substantially the same role for adept as Nelson did for tape. Hanman noted that Delano followed the recommendations of an adept advisory committee, which, in turn, apparently followed Hanman's recommendations. In fact, Hanman could not name anyone other than himself with significant control of adept's activities. Although ADEPT had a larger membership than SPACE, member donations were smaller, so that each trust generated approximately the same level of funds. In 1972, ADEPT, like SPACE, collected and spent approximately $300,000. End of Section 17 
Section 18 of the Watergate Report, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 2, Section 18. 2. $100,000 cash contributions to Kalmbach in 1969. AMPI's Objectives. By the time the dairy co-op movement coalesced in 1969, it found itself faced with a new Republican administration. Any administration can have a tremendous impact on the welfare and livelihood of dairy farmers, through its decision to set milk price support subsidies, import controls of dairy products, purchases of cheese and other dairy products, and other federal programs. The leaders of AMPI felt it was imperative for them and the dairy industry as a whole to meet with and win friends in the new administration. This presented a problem. Most of the AMPI leaders were Democrats, and the dairy co-ops had given extensive financial and other support of over $150,000 to Vice President Humphrey in his 1968 campaign. Parr testified, We didn't know anybody in Nixon's administration. We didn't have any rapport with the Nixon administration. Nelson indicated what proved to be at the heart of their problem. Although, in a civil deposition, Nelson stated that he did not recall ever having any great difficulty in gaining access to elected officials, in his testimony before the Select Committee on December 18, 1973, Nelson was asked if this was true for the Nixon administration in 1969. Mr. Weitz, would you care to say that that did not apply to the administration in 1969? Mr. Nelson, that is right. It did not apply. Mr. Weitz, it did not apply? Mr. Nelson, it did not apply. The first step to gain access to the new administration and achieve certain specific co-op goals was apparently a $100,000 cash contribution delivered to Herbert Kalmbach, the president's personal lawyer and chief fundraiser. This matter, including the method in which the contribution was ultimately generated from AMPI corporate funds through an elaborate and expensive laundering scheme, is discussed in the following sections. A. AMPI contacts with administration officials and Kalmbach prior to the contribution. 1. John Mitchell, Jack Gleason, and referral to Herbert Kalmbach. Nelson turned to Jacobson for an entry to the new administration. At that time, Jacobson was a member of two law firms, Jacobson and Long in Austin, Texas, which was already on retainer to MPI for $2,500 per month, and Seymour and Jacobson in Washington. Jacobson reported to Nelson that his Washington partner, Milton Seymour, had previously had contact with John Mitchell and might be able to provide assistance. On or about March 21, 1969, Parr, and probably Nelson, met with Jacobson and Seymour in the Washington office to discuss the problem. At about that time, the Seymour and Jacobson firm were also placed on a $2,500 per month retainer to MPI. There is a dispute in the testimony whether or not Seymour contacted John Mitchell in 1969 for AMPI, and whether Mitchell then referred Seymour to Kalmbach. Both Seymour and Mitchell have advised the committee that they recall no such contact, However, several witnesses state that Seymour had said at the time that he had contacted or intended to contact Mitchell for the milk producers in 1969. Kalmbach said that Seymour had told him that he had been referred by Mitchell, and following the first meeting, Kalmbach called Mitchell to verify Seymour's account. In addition, Nelson testified that he learned from Jacobson that Seymour had contacted Mitchell, who referred him to Kalmbach. Jacobson, too, in his testimony in an earlier deposition in a civil suit, had testified that Seymour told him that he had been referred to Kalmbach by Mitchell. After conferring with Seymour recently, however, Jacobson, in testimony before the Select Committee on December 14, 1973, stated that he does not believe that Seymour told him that he had been referred by Mitchell. Seymour has conceded to the committee that, at his first meeting with the AMPI representatives in March 1969, and in his first meeting described below in April with Kalmbach, he explained his previous contacts with Mitchell and Maurice Stans in 1968 and earlier, but testified that he does not think he mentioned going to Mitchell to establish contact with the administration for AMPI. 
instead he indicated that he was going to contact jack gleason who was then an assistant to stans at the commerce department and who became a white house staff assistant to harry dent later in nineteen sixty nine whatever mitchell's involvement in this effort it is undisputed that seymour did contact gleason on or about march twenty fifth nineteen sixty nine seymour told gleason of his client's dilemma and informed him of ampi's political fund according to seymour gleason expressed great interest at that meeting and in contacts with him in the subsequent months in the fund and its potential and referred him to kalmbach as discussed below kalmbach learned of seymour and a possible one hundred thousand dollar contribution apparently on the same day seymour spoke to gleason march twenty fifth nineteen sixty nine in an interview with the select committee staff gleason described his role as one of massaging fat cats and while he does not remember meeting with seymour in nineteen sixty nine about this matter he said he would have preferred all potential presidential contributors to kalmbach seymour denied having discussed a specific contribution with gleason during their contacts in early nineteen sixty nine however in view of gleason's interest in ampi's potential and his sending seymour to kalmbach it seems that gleason at the very least believed that the efforts of ampi to gain access to the republican administration would involve a contribution that is exactly what happened as a result of the subsequent contacts between seymour and kalmbach two contacts with kalmbach one hundred thousand dollars in cash seymour testified that he found gleason's referral of him to kalmbach understandable he explained that in previous administrations there had often been lawyers outside the government who served in advisory capacities to the president seymour believed that kalmbach was such a presidential adviser who could provide him with an understanding of the organizational structure of the nixon white house whatever seymour's perception kalmbach at that time was serving in an important financial role for the white house in nineteen sixty nine Kalmbach testified that on or about January 14, 1969, Stans asked Kalmbach to serve as trustee for the surplus funds from the 1968 presidential campaign. Kalmbach agreed. He understood that he was to act under the direction of Haldeman, to whom he reported on his activities in connection with the fund. Haldeman did not dispute that Kalmbach reported to him, although he noted that Kalmbach received instructions from others, too, with respect to the fund seymour met with kalmbach in washington in early april and again in early may seymour testified that in each instance he described his client's potential for making political contributions to both parties and at all levels including the president although he claims there was no discussion at that time of a specific contribution to the president he testified that kalmbach was always interested in that potential which seymour described as one million dollars per year and that the technique of political contributions was constantly discussed right from the start other evidence gathered by the select committee indicates however that at least at one of these meetings and perhaps both a specific contribution was in fact discussed seymour testified that he regularly reported the results of his kalmbach meetings to the client and jacobson and both Nelson and Jacobson testified that in those reports they were advised that Kalmbach requested a contribution of $100,000 in cash. According to Nelson, Seymour reported back from Kalmbach that, if we wanted to go forward with the relationship, that we should deliver $100,000 in cash. Jacobson recalled that he was told by Seymour that at the second meeting Kalmbach suggested a cash contribution of $100,000 probably the most persuasive evidence that a specific contribution was discussed at the outset was provided to the select committee by kalmbach on march twenty second nineteen seventy four following his guilty plea to two federal violations kalmbach testified that seymour explained that they had supported senator humphrey's candidacy in nineteen sixty eight and now they were without friends of the administration and this was the reason they wanted to make a contribution kalmbach testified that at either the first meeting in april or some time later seymour indicated the contribution would be one hundred thousand dollars according to kalmbach seymour told him that in fact their goal was a total of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars by the end of the year the account that the one hundred thousand dollars was discussed right from the start is corroborated by kalmbach's contemporaneous entries in his logs 
on march twenty fifth nineteen sixty nine the day seymour first contacted gleason for the milk producers there is the following entry m h stands seymour one hundred thousand dollars on april second nineteen sixty nine the day before seymour met with him kalmbach wrote in his logs milton seymour attorney in washington d c one hundred thousand dollars milk producers association the suggestion that an additional one hundred and fifty thousand dollars would be contributed by the end of the year for a total of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars is also supported by kalmbach's log entries in june and july nineteen sixty nine there are several references in connection with seymour to one hundred to two hundred and fifty including the following entry for the week of june thirtieth m h s seymour one hundred two hundred and fifty twelve thirty one after a number of telephone calls with kalmbach in june and july seymour on july tenth nineteen sixty nine flew to california and met kalmbach in his newport beach office seymour acknowledged that in the course of their telephone conversations and the july tenth meeting he gained no further information on the white house organizations and possible contacts for ampi the only matter on which progress was made was that of a contribution on july ninth the day preceding his meeting with kalmbach seymour stopped at the executive inn hotel in dallas and met with nelson parr and jacobson seymour conceded that they discussed the fact that nothing had resulted from the previous contacts with kalmbach and that there may have been a discussion of making a contribution parr was more direct he testified that seymour related that kalmbach had already asked for one hundred thousand dollars in cash and that at the july ninth meeting there was a discussion of obtaining and delivering the money in fact there was some suggestion that all four of them would meet with kalmbach however it was decided that seymour would go alone since according to seymour kalmbach preferred dealing with just him and not a group at the july tenth meeting which essentially reviewed previously discussed matters kalmbach reiterated the administration's receptiveness to a contribution as to the question whether the contribution would be reported seymour's and kalmbach's recollections differ seymour recalls a discussion of reporting requirements while kalmbach says there was none not then and not in any of the conversations between the two in any event it must have become increasingly clear to seymour if not on or before july tenth then shortly thereafter that kalmbach had no plans to report the cash contribution jacobson and nelson both testified that they were told kalmbach did not want the contribution reported seymour himself testified that kalmbach on more than one occasion expressed a preference for cash and that this so disturbed him that he called kalmbach between july tenth and the delivery to ask if kalmbach would accept the contribution in checks again kalmbach expressed a preference for cash kalmbach disputes the evidence that he requested that the contributions be in cash on the contrary he testified that seymour told him it would be made in cash however kalmbach admitted that no committees were yet in existence which could have him listed as receiving the contribution so as to avoid violating the prohibition in the correct practices act against making a contribution in excess of five thousand dollars to any one candidate or political committee as discussed in chapter four of the committee's report on campaign financing the select committee found repeated instances in which kalmbach and other presidential fundraisers received cash from contributors to keep their fundraising efforts secret furthermore as explained in chapter four the nineteen sixty eight surplus funds transferred to kalmbach's control were in two forms several checking accounts and cash in several safe deposit boxes kalmbach testified that haldeman had made clear to him that he should maintain the original nature of the funds as much as possible that is try to maintain the original balance in the cash and the checking account however in nineteen sixty nine kalmbach was already dispersing substantial amounts from the cash fund therefore in order to follow haldeman's instructions kalmbach would have had to seek cash to replenish the fund as explained below the ampi contribution was added to that fund three purpose of the contribution ampi's three objectives 
the select committee has obtained evidence that the purpose of the one hundred thousand dollar cash contribution was not merely to gain access to the nixon white house but also to lay the groundwork for favorable treatment in certain specified ways by the administration for ampi and the dairy industry as noted above the ampi leadership understood that the contribution was being suggested by kalmbach as a first step to making contact with the white house notwithstanding seymour's insistence that there was no direct connection between the contribution and access other evidence gathered by the select committee points the other way in his testimony kalmbach was quite explicit although denying he initiated the idea kalmbach did testify that he understood before the contribution was made that in exchange for the contribution seymour and his clients would be granted the opportunity to meet with white house officials according to kalmbach that was not all ampi sought he testified that ampi through seymour made clear that in connection with the contributions of up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in nineteen sixty nine it had three objectives in mind and that seymour stated these to him both before and at the time of delivery of the one hundred thousand dollars kalmbach wrote in his logs on august second nineteen sixty nine the day he received the one hundred thousand dollars from seymour a ninety per cent price supports for dairy farmers b president to address gathering in kansas city missouri a meeting of dairy farmers cooperatives organized by milk producers incorporated open date c identification with the president picture taking etc at another point in his logs for the week of june tenth nineteen sixty nine also in connection with the milk producers kalmbach had written the following entry one ninety per cent of parity two w h audience three farm speeches visible identification and it's still a third place in his logs on june thirteenth nineteen sixty nine he wrote m h s objectives seymour one hundred to two hundred and fifty kalmbach in turn informed top white house officials of these matters he testified that after the contribution was discussed but before its delivery he reported to haldeman the pending contribution and the three goals and haldeman authorized him to accept the contribution kalmbach's logs indicate that he apparently discussed the contribution and the milk producer objectives with stans too after the receipt of the contribution kalmbach reported that fact and reiterated the three goals to haldeman haldeman stated to the select committee staff on january thirty first nineteen seventy four i don't recall that that is something i may or may not have known at the time kalmbach reported some things to me he generally kept me informed on what he was doing kalmbach's testimony that he reported the contribution and ampi's interests to others in the white house and the administration including ehrlichman pete flanagan who had some responsibility in the area of dairy matters gleason and dent is corroborated by other evidence obtained by the select committee kalmbach's logs reflect notes of conversations with ehrlichman and stans about the milk producers their contribution and their objectives and ehrlichman told the committee staff on february eighth nineteen seventy four even before kalmbach testified on such matters that kalmbach did in fact tell him of his contact with seymour and of the contribution with respect to the substance of his communications on this matter to the white house officials kalmbach testified i never at any time indicated to mr haldeman as i remember it that the quid pro quo for the receipt of this contribution would be the attainment of the three stated objectives mr sanders did mr haldeman ever give you any understanding that their objectives would be met mr kalmbach no he did not mr sanders did mr ehrlichman ever give you any understanding in advance of the seymour delivery that the objectives would be met mr kalmbach no other than mr haldeman indicated to me it would be that the objective of mr seymour meeting with various people within the white house would be met mr sanders but not that their ultimate objectives would be mr kalmbach that is correct mr sanders did any white house official give you an understanding that their ultimate objectives would be met mr kalmbach no sir however 
kambach did say there was an understanding with seymour and white house officials that a benefit would accrue to the milk producers in exchange for the contribution in return for that contribution it would be possible for me to arrange for several appointments with various people within the white house in order for mr seymour and the attorneys for the milk producers to meet with the white house officials to present a case on their behalf having reached an understanding the milk producers next prepared to deliver the money b the contribution preparation and delivery the one hundred thousand dollars in cash was assembled by the milk producers in late july nineteen sixty nine on august first bob lilly delivered it to seymour and the next day august second seymour delivered it to kalmbach under the direction of white house aides kalmbach used the money in part to fund the undercover activities of anthony lasowitz and the democratic primary challenge to george wallace in nineteen seventy as a result of the contribution dairy co-op leaders were then introduced to certain white house officials at the time of the contribution mpi and tape maintained sizable accounts at the citizens national bank of austin of which jacobson was chairman of the board in an affidavit submitted to the select committee marvin stetler who was at that time president of the bank affirmed that in late july nineteen sixty nine jacobson informed him that one hundred thousand dollars in cash was to be withdrawn from the tape account and made available by a certain date which proved to be august first nineteen sixty nine jacobson told him that the authorization for the withdrawal was to be a debit memo and that lilly was to receive the money stettler states that he told jacobson that it would take several days to accumulate that much currency as recalled by lilly stettler told lilly that he was assembling old bills bob lilly provided the committee with the details of the transactions he says that on august first he went to citizens national bank to receive the money stettler gave him the previously prepared debit memo lilly signed it and stettler gave him the money according to lilly stettler first counted it stettler says lilly began to count it but was in such a hurry that he merely raked the money into an empty case and left the debit memo lilly signed reads as follows receipt of one hundred thousand dollars cash acknowledged this first day of august nineteen sixty nine per instructions of bob isham after receiving the money lilly went to dallas and in seymour's room in the executive inn delivered the money to him seymour says he had not previously known the actual amount to be contributed and was surprised by the magnitude after lilly left seymour bought a new flight bag to replace the attache case lilly had used and placed the money in it on saturday august second nineteen sixty nine seymour again flew to california and delivered the one hundred thousand dollars to kalmbach in his newport beach office kalmbach counted the money and on the following monday august fourth placed it in the safe deposit box in the security pacific national bank newport center branch which he had opened in july for some of the nineteen sixty eight surplus funds End of section eighteen